Good morning, church. How are we doing? My name's Turner, and this is my beautiful, wonderful fiance, Lindsay. Feels good to say that. Uh, we're going to transition into communion right now. And as we transition to communion, I want to bring up a scripture that's weighed on my heart since uh, the times where I was studying a Bi the Bible six years ago. Uh, and the chapter is in Romans 6. Uh, Romans 6 is what I believe to be a great chapter that helps us interact with the cross. It shows how we connect with Jesus through his death on the cross. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. Uh, we're going to read a small section of it. Okay, verses 11 through 14. It says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
Therefore, do not let sin reign over your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself of yourselves to God as those who have been brought to death to life. And every part of yourselves is an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. And so here we see Paul talking about how the cross brings a new life. It brings, it takes all our sin, all our guilt, all our shame, and it, and it makes it empty so that we can be these awesome instruments for God. Okay, Lindsay's going to share about this a little bit. So when I think of a sin that has mastered, that mastered my life for a long time, I think of my pride and entitlement. And I would like to say that I only struggled with that before I became a Christian, but that would be untrue. Uh, and in fact, I would say my pride and entitlement was brought out most after I decided to follow Jesus. And I'm an equations person, which isn't inherently wrong, right? It's great for school, not so great for real relationships. And in my walk with God, my equation-oriented heart thought that if I did A plus B, then I will get C from God. That if I do all the right things, if I read my Bible, go to church, family group, share my faith, then I am entitled to the circumstances and timing that I thought best in my life. That what I thought ought to be the outcome of A plus B, that I should have the easy academic success, the boyfriend or husband and career plan exactly when and how I pictured it. And my relationship with God was almost entirely transactional. And my pride and entitlement led me to actually believe that I knew better than God, that he wasn't powerful enough to work things out in my life, and that I shouldn't have to endure hard things. So naturally, when things didn't play out exactly the way that I pictured, my faith went into a tailspin. I was angry, bitter, jealous, insecure, and refused to surrender my own will to God's. And instead of looking to God to find comfort when I felt disappointed or out of control, I, my sin actually drove me to distrust God, to distance myself from him, and wonder if I could do things better on my own. To be honest, I practically threw a temper tantrum with God when things didn't go my way. And anyone who's been around young children knows what I'm talking about. And at its worst, my pride led me to wonder what life would be like not having to submit to God's plan for my life, as if that could be a better option. But just like Jesus on the cross, God had my eternity in mind and allowed me to be broken down. I was at a crossroads of either choosing to go off and live my life apart from God as I saw fit, or finally submitting myself to God's will and giving up the notion that I know better. I needed to come to the end of my pride and surrender to him, and I don't think this ever would have happened without looking to the cross, looking to Jesus' own life and death. I had to realize that there is no one on this earth who knows suffering, disappointment, rejection, unfair circumstances better than Jesus. And in fact, nothing I ever go through in this life will even come close to comparing to what Jesus endured on the cross for me. And once I really internalized that, I found I was able to draw near to Jesus at the cross and find so much comfort and hope there, regardless of how things played out in my life. When I humbled myself at the cross, I was freed from the law, from my equations, from my pride, and all the junk that came along with that. And those things no longer controlled my heart and mind like they used to. And instead, I found grace and a much deeper connection with Jesus than I had known before. Thanks, Lynn. All right, guys, so we're going we're gonna to start praying for communion. But as we even reflect on the cross, as we take up communion, let us all consider uh, the things that may have enchanged us, the sin that enchains us, and, that the, and, and, and reflect on the power of the cross and how it sets us free and gives us new life for us to be a new instrument. Let's pray. Uh, God, we, just, we thank you so much for today. We thank you so much for Jesus and what he did on the cross, God. I pray that uh, we can see the power. We can see that, man, like, just as he resurrected, we get to resurrect into a new life, God, that we get to take our old self and we get to crucify it, God, and we get to live this new life dedicated to you, God. I pray that we can remember that, uh, that that can be something that weighs on our heart, not just on Sundays, but every day, um, and that it can be something that inspires us and motivates us to be something uh, better than we ever could be without you, God. We love you. It's my prayer. Amen.
Amen. Church, it's great to be together uh, this morning. Uh, fall break, so a lot of people out of town, but uh, great to see the faces that are still here. Uh, I do have just a couple announcements. We're continuing our bodybuilder series this morning. Um, the main announcement, campus students, we have our campus retreat coming up, I think in three weeks? Three weeks, all right? Retreat Center, Heartland Retreat Center in Kansas City will be together with the whole region. Uh, it's going to be a great time focusing on the book of Jonah, which I'm excited for because usually you don't have a, a retreat or a conference that's centered around the book of Jonah. And uh, Tanner and Jessica Versage are coming in from Chicago to speak, and it's going to be an awesome time. So get registered, $60, lodging, all your meals, that includes everything. So if you need help financially, talk to the person that invited you, and they can forward the link to you and get you all set up, okay? All right, so we're moving on here. Um, go ahead and turn over to Nehemiah chapter 8. That's where we're going to be this morning. Nehemiah chapter 8. I hope this series has been impacting or helpful so far. I know I have personally enjoyed studying Nehemiah and Ezra um, more so than I think I ever have before. Uh, and we've covered a lot of ground. I mean, we've covered a lot of history. We've covered a lot of scripture even, a lot of context. So I hope it, it's registering. I hope you're soaking at least some of it in. And uh, it's making the Bible come to life a little bit more. You're understanding a little bit more what it's talking about. But we're going through this because we want to build up the church to be radiant and to bring honor to God. And Nehemiah and Ezra provide several lessons in helping us do that. And so the first week, right, we're looking at these different building blocks to helping us build up the body of Christ. And so the first one we looked at was selflessness. The second one we looked at was prayer. Last week, we talked about righteousness and having a radical stance on righteousness, right? And we asked that question, what are the ites that you're allowing to linger in your life? And we saw Ezra's radical stance for righteousness of driving out all the ites, right? And calling everybody to separate themselves, to be holy. And so, guys, we've got to apply that to us. And as a church, we've got to take a stand for righteousness. Amen? And this morning, what we're going to be talking about, the building block, is God's Word. God's Word. And so we're, we're piggybacking a little bit off of this past Wednesday. For those of you who were there, we're using our midweeks uh, as a time to train the church on being more effective in making disciples. Okay, it's been awesome. I mean, we at, before we start each week, we draw names out of a hat and we practice sharing our faith. And it's the best and for some the worst time of the night. Uh, but th man, this past Wednesday was awesome, right? Carrie Hutchison and Blake got their names drawn. Carrie was, you know, practicing sharing her faith with uh, a young college student. And man, it, it was just so encouraging. It's so, um, it, we're just working our evangelistic muscles. And then we're going through and we're doing some training on how to study the Bible with somebody else, how to help someone else grow deeper in their relationship with God. And usually where we start is with God's Word. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason that we start on a foundational level when you're building a relationship with God. And similarly, as we're building up the body of Christ, we start with God's Word. Because if we don't have that, if God's Word is not the standard of our life, if we're not building on God's Word, nothing's going to last anyways. And so these are scriptures. You probably can't see these. I'll read them. These are three of the scriptures that we start off when we're studying about God's word with people. I'll read them. Romans 10 says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is word, heard through the word about Christ. Hebrews 1, it says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through prophets and many times in various ways. But in the last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir to all things. And through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. In 2 Timothy, 
It says, but as for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you've learned it. And how from infancy you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Guys, our faith grows by being in God's word. It's strengthened. It's built. Christ created and sustained all things through his powerful word. God's word makes us wise for salvation. His word equips us for every good work. I mean, my goodness, right? These are just three tiny passages, three little passages in all scripture. But guys, if if God emphasizes his word this much, how much more should we be emphasizing it with one another? We read this, wow, our faith comes, it grows from being in God's word. We're we're made wise for salvation. We're sustained. We're equipped. Guys, there there is no way that we can be faithful to God without being in his word. There's no way. If all those things are products of being in God's word, there's no way we can be faithful Christians. We can be faithful to God without being in his word. And Ezra and Nehemiah knew this. And so look in Nehemiah chapter 8. Right, we've been jumping around, okay, through uh, through both of these books, and so we're we're going to get to the actual building of the wall, but we're going to skip to right after it's built, and we're going to look at the first thing that happens, okay, Nehemiah chapter eight. So the walls get rebuilt, the front gates are put in place. All those punks that were trying to you know discourage them and get them to stop and wear them out are just silenced. And it actually says they weren't just silenced. It said they lost their confidence because they knew that God was with them and that God had been doing this work. I mean, it's a really cool scene. But now, now the city had been, kind, you know, uh, kind of the city walls had been rebuilt, the temple had been rebuilt, but there weren't many people living in it. And so what Ezra and Nehemiah do is they go through all these records, they figure out all the people that lived there, all the people that were taken in exile, and right, they're just collecting like a roster, basically, and they're trying to get in contact with everyone and bring them back into the city. Hey, guys, we can now live here. We've got to, we have to reestablish life here. So they get people to come back. They do some other, you know, cool things I won't get into. Um, Actually, I will get into it. You know, what they do is they, they establish this, habit where they didn't open the city gates until noon right they kept the city locked and they did it for a reason because they wanted to reestablish a separation between God's people and the rest of the world so every every morning when people would wake up the city would be closed off as a reminder that we are separate we're to be different from everybody else and they wouldn't open the gates to the rest of the surroundings until it says till the sun was hot all right, so sometime in the afternoon. So they repopulate the area. They, they bring everybody back. They kind of are reestablishing this culture of holiness. And then we get to Nehemiah chapter 8. And let's look and see what they do. This, this, is, this is a really powerful passage. Nehemiah chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 1. It says, When the seventh, seventh month came and the Israelites had settled into their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. And he read it aloud from daybreak until noon. As he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men and women and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood 13 guys, right? Ezra opened the book and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, all the people stood up. 
Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. And they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, 13 other men, instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, the teacher of the law, and the Levites, who were instructing the people, said to them all, This day is a holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah said, go, enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. Send some of those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. And then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. I mean, what a powerful passage. What, what a powerful scene. right? And I personally believe that this, this is the climax of the entire book of Nehemiah, which is interesting because a book about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, you would think the climax of the book would be when they built the walls of Jerusalem. But this is what's said about that. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul. That's it. It's like a little footnote. Oh, and by the way, they finished. But guys, we've got to ask ourselves, what was the goal in them rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, right? The goal, Ezra and Nehemiah's goal, was not to build a physical structure. It wasn't to necessarily accomplish a physical goal. It wasn't now to have this big city or this big temple or this wall or these homes. The goal was to rebuild their relationships with God. Right? Building the walls was, was a means to bringing people back so that they could reconnect with their God. And so the first thing that Ezra and Nehemiah did was educated the people in God's word. They knew that if we're going to build this thing, as we're reconnecting people to God, the first place we've got to start is by re-educating the people in God's word. Now, what had happened was, right, because there's some context here, as you know, because this wasn't just a spontaneous, random meeting where everyone's chanting, Ezra, dude, bring out the law, and then everyone's standing for six hours straight as he reads the law, and then they're weeping, and like, right, Ezra was not that dynamic of a speaker, okay, It says he just read the book of the law for six hours, all right? So this wasn't like this, you know, conference that you, whatever. That's not what was happening here. I have to tell myself that, all right? Because when I read this, I'm like, man, we've got to get, you know, when will our church services look like that? Right, but no no amount of entertainment, no amount of bands, no amount of whatever could produce what we just saw there. Something else was going on. And remember, guys, they had just spent 70 years in exile before the first exiles came back. All of the scripture was written in Hebrew. The main language in Babylon, and by that time spread to the rest of the world, was Aramaic. So, they were already kind of on the decline. People had already stopped passing on God's word to the next generation, and then all of a sudden they're taken into exile, at least two or three generations born in Babylon. So you have a couple generations that grew up speaking Aramaic with no access to God's word, and even if they did have access to it, it was in a different language. So try, try to imagine for a second, you just stop reading the Bible for the rest of your life, Okay? You stop reading your Bible for the rest of your life, but you're still going to try to live faithfully. And then you have kids, and they never read the Bible. You never read it to them. And you try to just pass on to them what you remember. 
and try to help them live faithfully. And then they grow up and they have kids. They never read the Bible. All your kids remember is what you passed on to them, if they remember any of it. And then all they pass on to their kids is what you taught them, if they remember any of it. And then you fast forward to those kids having kids. How much of God's word do you think they really remembered? None. And then by that point, everybody spoke a different language and they couldn't even understand it even if they wanted to. Does that make sense? So what's going on here is they finally get back and you got Ezra, who we know, I don't know if I have it up here. He was a teacher well-versed in the law. The gracious hand of God was on him for Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and the laws of Israel. Ezra's a pretty significant figure here. And so what Nehemiah does is he passes it on, hey, Ezra, you're up, man. But guys, the problem is somewhere along the way, people stopped passing on God's word. And that is not uncommon. For whatever reason, there is a tendency for us to stop passing on God's word to our kids or to the next generation. I mean, even think as a church. Think about 20 years ago. What percentage of a church service would have notebooks out, taking notes of all the scriptures that were read, memorizing scripture each week? What percentage of the congregation was doing that? A lot. You look now, I won't even ask if I have everybody raise up who has a notebook today, right? There's just a different, it's different. There's a tendency for as generations go on, we start lacking a little bit in passing on God's word to a younger generation and even our kids. You know, parents, how much are we using God's word to teach our kids? How much? I love that we have a memory scripture downstairs in Kids Kingdom. I love it. I think I have, so I'm going to skip ahead, Jason, sorry. I have a video on here. I don't know if it's going to work. Oh, is this going to work? Maybe sound? Jason, we got sound. What do you think? Maybe. Oh, can we start over? Yes. Psalm 119, verse 105. One, two, five. Your red is near to the sea. And, uh, and, uh, I love it so much, right? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path, right? That's the kid's kingdom memory verse. And I caught a little video of it, Katie, working on it with the girls. She did that. I, guys, we've, we've got to be diligent about passing on the conviction of how important God's word is to our kids and to the next generation. We cannot, we cannot lose that. And that's part of what happened here. And so now all of a sudden you had multiple generations that are showing back up and not only do they not really know it, but even like they, they can't even, they don't even speak the language. And so Nehemiah and Ezra, man, they came up with an awesome plan. They trained these, these Levites and they scattered them out throughout the crowd. And Ezra's standing up on this platform and he would read God's word and then those Levites It'd be like, I don't know, large, small groups, right? So he's, pre, he's reading it in Hebrew, and then all those Levites are translating it from Hebrew to Aramaic because that's what people spoke. And so they're continuing to do that, and then they're taking time to say, guys, you know what this means? This is what this practically means. I mean, think everything we talked about last week. Think about reading for the first time, not to intermarry, not to do, and they're, they're for the first time hearing these commands from God, and it just, they weep. For the first time in generations, they finally understood God's word. What, I, I get chills just thinking about that. I mean, guys, you know, think, think of, I can't imagine going multiple generations, and then finally you get a, people, a group of people together, and you're just reading, and what was their response? They were hungry for it. 
They, Ezra didn't come out and say, you guys better show up because we're going to read the law and da 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 It says they, they asked Ezra to bring the law out. Like they're like, oh, we, we finally get to hear God's law after so long. And he's reading it and it's being translated to them. And they're weeping. So much so that Ezra and Nehemiah are having to be like, guys, this is actually like a good day. Right? Like, don't, don't weep. Go celebrate. Like, we, the law has been restored. You, can, you finally know what you're trying to say. Guys, what is our response to God's word? How eager are we to be in God's word? Because when it comes to the Bible, ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance of God, ignorance of God's word makes it impossible to please God. It's not just a, oh man, bummer, didn't know that was in there. Well, well, like, no, ignorance is not bliss when it comes to God's word. If you're ignorant of God's word, you're going to be ignorant of what it means to live a faithful life. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Ignorance of God's word breeds generations aren't pleasing to God, that can't please God. Nehemiah knew that they needed to get back to God's word. And so him and Ezra devoted so much time to educating God's people in his word. I want to show a video here, all right? Got a video of an example. Um... This is from our Russian churches, an example of this eagerness to learn, okay? I don't know where it's at. Maybe it's here. Jason will pull it up whenever he's able to. God does an amazing thing in Eurasia through supporting our publishing house. We can see how Christians teach us uh, makes stronger and inspire Russian-speaking people through the books and media resources, especially due to lack of local teachers and elders in churches in Eurasia. Я благодарна за эту книгу, потому что она помогает многим зрелым ученикам обрести мир, радость и примириться со своим негативным опытом. Спасибо за эту книгу. Достаточно хорошее воспитание. Она помогает нам быть прекрасными родителями. Я пока еще не женат, и я очень благодарен за эту книгу, потому что она дала мне понимание того, что Бог дал мне специально этот период в жизни, чтобы я наслаждался жизнью, испытал жизнь с избытком. И через это прославлял Бога. Я понял, благодаря прочтению этой книги, что помощь от людей это большое благословение. Thanks to our publishing grant and the tireless work of translators, life-changing teaching is reaching thousands of Russian-speaking disciples across Eurasia. In the very near future, we'll see the completion of grief recovery resources, as well as six new titles that will be added to our existing catalog of over 50 titles. We want to thank you for your support in maturing disciples in Eurasia. We ask that you continue to give faithfully, prayerfully, and generously. Thank you very much. So, I, I remember getting to um, go to Russia a couple times. Um, but our, so our church and our Heartland family of churches, we support financially our churches throughout Russia, okay? So every year when we take up special missions collection, a third of that goes to Eurasian missions. And I remember going out there for the first time in 2015 and, you know, just asking questions, getting to know the situation. And the biggest thing they wanted, you know, they needed was translated books. I was like, huh, interesting. Of all the things that, you know, can, can, thank you guys so much for your support. We need more so that we can translate books. And th 
there was something I didn't, I didn't really understand. Like, we're so, there's just, Christianity is just saturated in our society. Over there, everything's Russian Orthodox. Um, imagine, like, the most boring, <laughs> traditional, ritualistic setting. I, whatever. It's hard to even explain. Everything's, you know, recited in another language. It's just like, whatever. Whatever comes to your mind when you think that, that's, that's all they've got. And so, you know, when we planted churches there back in the, whatever, 40 years ago-ish, those are really the first generation of, I would say, true, like disciples that you've got around there. And so it's not like they just have all of these Christian resources and all these teachings of whatever. Like, I, hey, I want to study out Nehemiah. Let me text my buddy. Uh, hey, you got any good books on Nehemiah and Ezra? Yeah, here's seven books you can read. Okay, awesome, cool. Which one's the best? Oh, let me read Spark Notes. Whatever, right? Like, we could do that with anything. Marriage book. Hey, let's go through this marriage book. Hey, here's this parenting book. Hey, here's this whatever. And it's all biblically based teaching. They don't have any of that. And so the thing that was highest on their priority list that they needed funding for was to be able to translate books that we had into Russian so that they could start teaching parenting. So they could, like, think of, think of all the books, like, that you have from Gordon Ferguson or Douglas Jacoby or what. They haven't had any of that. And so recently, within the last five to ten years, they now, they, they have a, a, you know, a couple dozen books, and they're in the process of finishing some more. So pretty soon, they're going to have 50 books translated in Russian. You saw the guy holding up that good enough parenting book? They just got that. Like, these are books that we've been reading, our parents read to help raise, you know, like, and they're just now, but there's such a desire to learn and to understand how to apply God's word to our life on a deeper level. And so when I, when I read this passage about people just weeping and people hungering to be taught and, and be able to understand God's word, I think about our churches over in Russia because they just have a, they're, they're hungry to learn God's word. And, and it's just interesting to me that in Nehemiah 8, nobody had access to God's word, but they were starving for it. And in our day and age, everybody has access to God's word. Everybody. Everybody in our country not only just has access to the Bible, but has access to unlimited resources to understanding the Bible. But it's... Are we, do we have that same hunger, right? I was reading a, uh, a study. So there's a group, it's called the Barna Group. They do, a, they do study on the usage of the Bible in America. And every year they put out the state of the Bible, you know, report. And they've been doing this for a couple decades now. And they go through, you know, the X percentage of U.S. adults use the Bible, da, da, da. And I was reading, when I was working on this, I was reading through it. And it said, like, you know, in 2019, we hit an all-time low that it was like 45% of U.S. adults you are using the Bible. And I was like, that's an all-time low? That seems oddly high. It's like, really? 45% of adults are using the Bible? And then I did, you know, I read through all of it. Da, da, da. Their definition of a Bible user. Someone who reads or listens to or prays with the Bible on their own, outside of church, three to four times a year. I was like, whoa, okay, there we go. So that makes more sense. The, the definition of a Bible user in our country is someone that reads or prays with or listens to the Bible three to four times a year. So then I kind of like, re-kind of translated all the stats knowing that, and really what it is, 95% of U.S. adults read their Bible less than five times a year. I'm like, that's more like it, okay? Guys, that's, that's sad. We're, and so we've got to ask ourselves, where are we at as a church? Right? I mean, there was a day and age where it's like, man, guys, we need to be having our quiet, we need to be in our Bible every morning, every day. Now it's like, you know, yeah, yeah, if I can get four or five, yeah, and then we're studying the Bible with people, and it's like, man, try to, try to get in the Bible each day, you know, da, da, da. 
It's like, yeah, I was able to read like two or three times this week. Okay, amen. It's like, man, we're passing on a weaker conviction of God's word. And next thing you know, there will be generations that are born that are ignorant of God's word. And ignorance is not bliss when it comes to God's word. And so, guys, as we build up the body of Christ, we cannot, we cannot get away from God's word. We've got to fight to remain hungry and to learn to apply God's word to our life. We've got to fill our conversations with God's word. We've got to spend time each day in God's word. We've got to teach our children God's word. We've got to make sure as a church we are rooted in God's word. I hope, as you see, when we come together on Sundays, we are going to learn the Bible. We're not going to apologize for it. I don't care if you think it's boring. I don't care if half of it goes over your head. We're going to keep digging into it because we are not going to be a biblically illiterate church. We are going to study God's word. We are going to know God's word. And we are going to have a culture of being students of God's word. Because the closer and closer we, or the further and further we get away from God's word, the further and further we're going to get away from God. And so, guys, as we close out this morning, we got to remind ourselves how important it is to be a church that is built on God's word. Amen. And so my application, i got a little, a little application for us. Come up with your own memory verse and have a monthly memory verse. Pick it, pick it yourself. I, I've got mine. Mine is that one that I read in Ezra 7. That's mine. That's my, that's my memory verse for this month. In my quiet times, I'm reading through different stuff, but I'm memorizing this one. Pick a memory verse each month to memorize. Maybe you're going to do it as a family. Maybe you're going to do it as a married couple. Maybe you're going to do it as an individual. Whatever. Each month, pick a different memory verse. Amen? So, guys, let's be a church that's built on God's word. Let's pass on God's word, and let's hold firm to the conviction that we are going to know, we are going to learn, we are going to study God's word. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer and we'll close out with a song. Father, good morning. Uh, Father, thank you for Nehemiah. Thank you for Ezra. I, I'm just inspired by Ezra's example. God, of being a student, you know, a student of your word, fully devoting himself to learning and understanding and practicing your word. God, I pray that we can be Ezra's. God, that we can be men and women that are devoted to your word. I love how it says your hand was with Ezra and everything he did because he had devoted himself to the study and the practice of your word. God, I pray that we can do the same. God, I pray that we would be a church that's built on your word. Father, that we would not be biblically illiterate, that it wouldn't become something that we just, you know, do if it's convenient or if we have time. But, Father, that we would put as our highest priority studying out your word. Father, we love you. We pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Close off here with one more song and enjoy the fellowship.